Good morning. Welcome to the recipe. Good morning, YouTube. Good morning, Facebook. And good morning, Instagram. <laughs> I see Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. Our daughter. She's on Instagram. Um, and I see a couple on Facebook. I just don't see your names yet. If you say hi, I can see your names. You guys are farther away. And I may have... Uh, oh, there it is. Hi, Bam. <laughs> hi. How, how y'all doing? Okay, so we're a few minutes late. Um, but it's okay. Because um, it, that's the way it is around here on Saturdays. <laughs> Uh, if you have a long Friday night, you got a, um, um, a, sh uh, um, a slow Saturday morning. But um, this is our uh, first of the first Saturdays each month. It's the fourth of all of them, but yes. Okay, he yes. says it's the fourth of all of them. Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah, so this is the fourth one, but today begins the the routine of every first Saturday of coming on and just having a conversation with you while we eat our breakfast. Um, and um, Dr. Woodard, you all, along with myself, have uh, got him to have made him commit to at least one Saturday out of the month. Uh, and he says it's going to be the first Saturday. And I thank him so much. Y'all send him some hearts or something. Tell him thank you. Listen, <laughs> my contract is up. <laughs> and I've got, no, this, so, wait a minute now. This contract ain't up. This, yeah, you're, you're, this contract ain't going to never be up. My, my television contract you, is up. Your television contract? Yes. Okay, well, let's make sure we got the contract straight. Yeah. Uh, and somebody said, yay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bam. Yay, yeah, yay. Yeah. Okay, yes, please encourage him. Please thank him and let him know that he's appreciated. Yeah. Um, so, um, let me tell you what we're having for breakfast this morning. Uh, because we did get up, uh, quite early this morning, um, he... A lot of work done. We, we did. We got a lot done. Um, but, um, I went ahead and made him a bowl of cream of wheat. So, he has already had some cream of wheat. Earlier. A couple hours ago. Yeah. We were up early. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, while I let him nibble on that, I went to Costco yesterday and I got all these fresh berries. Now, he's going to have to explain to you why I went all in with these berries. Why did I go all in with these berries? We were listening to... I don't know. No, <laughs> no. listen. Um, you know, the, the, because of the phytonutrients in yeah. the fruit, and it does so much better, and we were listening to... A podcast um, cardiologist, actually, she's a former cardiologist who's become a nutritionist of of great renown, um, talking about eliminations of things in diets such as soy, but um, additions of the phytonutrients that fruits provide. And um, I'm not ready to divulge my second book, but it was this morning that I put some stuff together and actually put a title on the second book that I'm writing. And um, um, it has it's a lot to do, to <laughs> right, it has a lot to do with um, where I am in just the thought processes of, of what it means to be uniquely human, um, to know, think about, you know, our Garden of Eden experience and the evolution that uh, brought that about. Um, just, you know, understanding uh, how God uses things. And, and I'm, I'm constantly trying to ask questions that move me in, into a whole nother realm of thought and, and whatnot. And so, um, yeah, I, I was looking around. I was peddling a couple thoughts as uh, Costas Kamparakis and I were talking. He is a, um, a German uh, by 
native nativity, um, but he's written one of the best books I've ever read on understanding evolution. And uh, just going through some things. So anyways, uh, the phytonutrients, absolutely important. Long story short, you need to eat a lot of fruit, a lot of veggies. Stay away from the stuff that will kill you. Um, and I'm only saying that you don't have to take me seriously, but there's a lot of evidence out there right now that cholesterol is not your friend. And I mean, it's it personally, he yeah. can, it's personal for him yeah. really at yeah. this point in his life that is not your friend. And the other thing about berries is that, and especially pomegranate, dark berries, your blackberries, I got blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, and strawberries. Your berries are what... Uh, if you will, um, increase the health of the arteries in your heart. Berries are heart healthy. Um, and so um, yesterday I, I made him a berry juice yesterday. And I got up this morning and I made another berry juice. <laughs> so all the berries that you see in our bowls here, I juiced uh, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries. And I added some grapes and one... Um, honey crisp apple, which sweetens it right up because I don't know if you know, but berries in and of themselves can have kind of a bitter taste. So to add some sweetness, you add some grapes, some red grapes, and you add some uh, maybe a, a honey crisp apple. But I'm gonna tell you what, he is gonna absolutely love this. Uh, you'll see the expression on his face. I'm gonna mm -hmm. let you pour that, Daddy. Okay, so we're having uh, the berries. Um, and we're also having uh, whipped coconut cream with honey in it. And it is delicious. Coconut cream, organic coconut cream with honey in it. Whipped up. Going to put it over these berries. Just like that. I don't know if he wants to do that. But if he wants to, he can. And then I have here... Uh, Cinnamon granola and in this granola, what did I do with the bag? Okay, so in this granola You have five super grains, so it's very high in fiber and it has uh, Flaxseed which is very good for you. It's flaxseed so that's what's in the granola. Doesn't have any nuts because he can't do the nuts per se because of his health, his heart health diet. Um, I can do nuts. <laughs> but he can't. I think if he does, it has to be walnuts. If you just want to do nuts, it has to be walnuts. I just stayed away from everything. Okay. So I'm going to sprinkle that on there. All right. Now if you want some, Daddy, you can have some if you don't. He don't want the granola. You don't want the granola? Okay, bless the food. Bless she doesn't know I've already put it on there. Oh, you put it first? You always put the granola on top of the cream, Daddy. <laughs> Y'all. Okay, oh, the granola is it's fruit, creamy topping, and then the granola, y'all. The granola is the crowning glory of your fruit Parfait. Okay. Bless the fruit parfait, Daddy. I told you all not to tell. Anyway. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the food that we're about to receive, that it might bring nourishment to our bodies and we'll do better work for thee. In Christ Jesus' name, we ask you to bless it to our keeping. Amen. 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 So, um, as I was preparing for this morning's uh, breakfast with uh, Mel and Bev, um, he he um, came from his office and he said, you know, let's ask some questions today. He says, it doesn't have to be a Bible study per se, but let, let's ask some questions. So let's see if they got some questions that they would like to ask us. So if we get up close on the screen, <laughs> it's because we're trying to read your questions, okay? Um but I, I think I can see questions from where I'm sitting. I kind of pulled it closer this time so we can, you know, read some questions. Yeah, they're all waving. Who, who's waving? That group right there. They're waving. They're waving? Mm -hmm. The Instagram group? Mm-hmm. 
or the YouTube, uh, which group? That's Instagram. Okay, hi Instagram. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, now if you don't give me the questions now on on Facebook, I can truly see your questions. Okay, so because um, I have my laptop here, so I can see questions that may uh, come up that you may be asking. All right. Um, so good morning, Anita. Good morning, Leslie Woods and Marion, Minister Mason. Good morning. Okay, um, I gotta refresh this because there's more people than that on here. Somebody said hey. Okay, so anyway, um, while Dr. Woodard starts eating uh, somewhat. Um, the one thing I want to talk about, well, I want to talk about today, and you may have questions about this particular thing. Um, I wanted to talk about, out of the five uh, things to fail-proof your marriage, I wanted to talk about fighting fair. I wanted to go a little bit deeper into that. I mean, because, you know, when you think about marriage, what is the one thing that drives a wedge between a husband and a wife is when they don't agree, <laughs> right? Right, when they're like, no, and you're like, yeah. Okay, so the one thing, <laughs> one of the things that will drive a wedge and cause conflict and contention in a home is when there is a disagreement, a serious disagreement. Um, and so... Um, the, the truth of the matter is when two people, even though they're whole in Christ, and heaven forbid if they're not whole in Christ, when they come together, they're going to come together as two imperfect individuals. So what are you saying, Sister Woodard? You're going to have some fights. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have some fights, right, Dr. Woodard? You're going to have a fight. You know, you may average one one small one a day, or you may average one big one a month, but you're going to have some fights. Um, and, you know, the Bible's very clear on that. It, the Bible's very, I say the Bible's very clear on that because of the verses that you find in the Bible that talk about, you know, a quarrelsome wife. Why would the Bible speak about a quarrelsome wife? Because there has been some fighting, okay? Um, and so... You're going to have fights, but as uh, ones, um, as children of God, hopefully trying to be intimate allies, we have to fight fair. And a lot of times we don't fight fair. Um, and, and we're going to talk about and discuss some of those ways that we inadvertently don't fight fair. We think we're fighting fair when we're making our point. But even when we're making our point, sometimes we're not fighting fair. Uh, and so I love uh, how he addresses that. He gives lots of illustrations of things that happen between him and his wife. And that's, of course, the book uh, that we've been coming from, From This Day Forward, Five Commitments to Fail Proof Your Marriage. Uh, which was gifted to us by uh, Sister Christian Parker. She and her husband are uh, leaders of our couple's ministry at New Salem. And so um, he talks about fixing the drip, fixing the drip. And in Proverbs, the 27th chapter and 15th verse says, A quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. <laughs> a quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Now, quarrelsome right there tells you that there's some fighting going on. And, you know, women today, um, because there's so many of us, in this, I mean, because we have excelled in the workplace and excelled as uh, single parents, um, excelled as single-handedly doing a lot of things on our own. Um, we don't bend as much as women bend, were bending back in the day. And so uh, sometimes, you know, it's a, it's a fight back more than, than a little bit. Um, and so 
um, we've got to learn some things so that it doesn't turn out that way. And then, you know, when the Bible talks about husbands loving your wives, like Christ loved the church. And you know me, in my Greek and Hebrew study Bible, I went up and I looked up that particular love in that verse. And it's not, it's not eros, it's not physical love. It's social and I care about you love. I care about what makes you happy. I'm listening to you. I'm not just going through emotions, uh, emotions, but I'm listening to what makes you tick. And I'm listening to those things that don't make you tick. Okay. So, uh, so the reality is couples fight, but Christian couples need to learn how and train themselves to fight fair, all right? And so we go over to James, and y'all know I love the book of James. I love the book of James. So we go over to James, that first chapter. James, the first chapter, where it talks about how <laughs> everyone should be quick to listen. Oh, my goodness. You know, many times when we read scripture, we want to apply it to everything and everybody else. But as couples, when we read scripture, we really need to apply it to our marriage first. Amen? Because if it don't work at home, it ain't going to work nowhere else. <laughs> okay. So when we read scripture, we need to apply that scripture directly to our marriage, to the relationship between a man and his wife. Because the relationship between Christ and the church is the same way. Christ is our bridegroom. Amen? And so when we look at scripture, we need to apply it to ourselves as couples. And as singles, we of course need to apply it to ourselves. But it says in James 1, the 19th and the 20th verse, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And we've all been there with our human anger. And, you know, when we're angry, when anger, and when anger has taken over, you know, there are some things that come out of our mouths that we wish we could take back. Some things we do that we wish we could take back. Because when we're angry... And it's okay to be angry because the Bible says you can be angry, but just don't sin. Um, but unbridled anger and unfiltered anger <laughs> and un out of control anger does not produce the righteousness of God. And we all know that. We've been there. We've seen that happen. Where when we were angry, it did not produce the righteousness of God. So with that verse in mind, there are three things that we need to just talk about. Think about those times when you wished you would have listened before you reacted or responded to something your husband or your wife said. Quick to listen. And the second thing we're going to talk about is slow to speak. And then the third thing is slow to anger. Okay. So, Dr. Woodard, I want you to uh, jump on in here right now. And I'm going to eat. <laughs> All right, yeah, and like I said, I, I don't want to necessarily, and just be very face, we don't want to turn this into Bible study as much as we can talk about things, and we probably should talk about a lot of stuff, and there's a lot of points in that book, a lot of points in, in this other book. We can bring those up as we, we kind of discuss some things. This morning in devotion, and I'm going to throw a piece out here, it, it's the book that Bev got me. Um, I love this book. It's called um, 365 Days. Uh, it's for teachers. It's like an apple a day. It's got this big red color to it. But it was talking about a text, very controversial text. Excuse me. And consequently, I'm going to read the text, but it goes back to where she was, and she was talking about, you know, quarreling and fighting and whatnot. But it's a controversial text, and you'll see why. 1 Peter 3, uh, and the text was 1 Peter 3, 4. I wanted that to be really clear. 1 Peter 3, 4. 
It says, but let your adorning be hid, be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Now, 1 Peter 3, 4, that was the text, that was the devotion this morning, and it, it, was, it, it was labeled uh, a gentle and quiet spirit. And it was talking about teachers. Now, first of all, teachers are not all uh, one gender, male, female, or female and male. We certainly realize we have uh, a, a greater quantity of female teachers. And so you can see why this female author of this text had seen this text. But if you go back to 3.1, it says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that if, even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. But uh, when they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. We, there's an overemphasis on that, 1 Peter 3.3. 3. 3, 4, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. And it was talking about teachers, instead of, you know, yelling at students and yelling at classes and trying to do this and that, about how many times can people count on you to have that quiet, gentle spirit? All right, put that alongside what she was saying about anger, about quarreling and whatnot. And I, we realize that as time goes on, and I think it's, it, you know, when you're first, and I talked about those, those levels, you know, that first romance, okay, uh, was the piece that I brought up, romance, and then a, a little bit of resentment and whatnot, things change, okay, the context changes in a relationship. So we're not talking about those initial days where we're putting on our best foot. But what happens after we get comfortable? What happens after we think we have a right to say something? And that goes, that goes both directions. But certainly, as a male, understand that females will definitely talk more than males on a, on a, on a, on a good <laughs> scale of time. Okay? So they want to talk it through, talk it out, talk. But that text is a reminder of the approach. Okay, a gentle, quiet spirit and how the approach can make a difference. I think oftentimes we forget about how the approach, whether it's male to female, female to male, male to male, female to female, makes a difference. Yeah. Because in just saying, you know, I'm going over there and I'm going to give a piece of my mind, I'm going to state what's on my heart. Listen, you can always state what's on your heart and mind, but it's the way you do it. So it doesn't have to break down into this, you know, don't cross this line, don't step in front of me, um, get out of my face. But as we as we we move along in marriage and yeah. grow in years, uh, we certainly, my father-in-law said it well, yeah. okay, and it was a reminder, Bev and I were talking the other night, said it well when, when, uh, she would ask him, Daddy, how you doing? This was after, this was post mama's knee operation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This put, was post put the context on it, right? Right, right. <laughs> and and he said, The Lord is helping me to love your mother. <laughs> Mama, if you're listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> and and oft times that really is a, a lot of the survival mechanisms of a male. <laughs> is the Lord is helping me to love you because right now you you've stepped into another you've stepped into another uh, a, a different moment. I see you in a different light. I hear you a different way, and hopefully I'm I'm prepared for that and I don't react to that. But you know, without God covering us and without the Spirit of God superintending moments. It, be, it does become confrontational. It does become argumentative. It does become hot because we're not prepared to receive what somebody else has been going over in their mind all day long. <laughs> okay? And that's a caution. And it, As it, much as I, you know, lady, it's a caution. Be careful. You've gone over the conversation a hundred times. He's not ready for that. Yeah. 
So be careful of the approach. And by the same token, guys can do it. I live in my head, but I live in my head not about relationships. I live in my head about things that need to be done. And if I have a fault line, that's where it's at. About things that need to be done, the next mountain to climb, the next feat to, to achieve, movie. And so I can forget about the relationships and the people around because I'm after the next assault uh, on life. So got to be careful about bringing, you know, forgetting the people behind you or around you um, and remembering to be, you know, gentle and quiet and, and have a good spirit so that people want to be with you when you come out of that big cocoon. <laughs> All right, I need to warm this up. Go okay, you said, so that people want to be with you. Uh, yeah, so I got to go back to my daddy was when he said that when I was on the phone with him. Mama had just had uh, her first total knee operation. She subsequently had the second one done. And so I said, Daddy, how are you doing? He said, God is helping me to love your mama. <laughs> uh, so, you know, she was in a lot of pain and he was... Um, pretty much taking care of her himself uh, post-operatively after she had come home. Uh, but, it, it, you know, it's true what Dr. Wood is saying. God is, God has to be in the center of a marriage in order for us to love each other effectively. Um, God is the only one that can love us completely. But for each of us to love each other effectively, we need God who brings complete love to a marriage. Um, and um, I read a, a, a wonderful compliment from my uh, nephew's wife, and hopefully Renee is on. Um, and she posted it on my YouTube channel, and she said what a blessing it was to see uh, Mel and myself, you know, do this live, now going to be doing it each month. Um, she said, it's a blessing to see couples. She said, many couples, you know, they, the Christian couples, she says, they, they love the Lord. She says, but not all of them are able to do what you all do and come, come together on a live, be in each other's company and do something like this together. And I just want to say to Renee, thank you for that, uh, just encouraging word to us. But I'm going to tell you what, this has been 30 years <laughs> in the making. Um, if, if could we have done this 30 years ago? I don't think so. No, because we really didn't know each other that well. We had four children. And we had four children, four <laughs> small children. Um, but uh, God in his grace and his mercy has allowed us to make it to almost 31 years. Yeah, we're in the 31st. We're, gonna we're in the 31st year. We're going to celebrate. Okay, Dr. Woodard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're in our 31st year, um, and he said, you know, and, and what, I, what I was thinking to myself is that it's only been because of God, his grace and his mercy, that we have grown, we have weaved and cleaved our lives together, we know each other better, uh, we can tell what the other one's going to do or say before it's even said, um, and that comes with time. Um, and uh, I have to, uh, hopefully my mom's listening on YouTube this morning, but one of the things she said to me um, when I got married, you know, she told me, she says, I'm going to have to talk to you differently now. And I said, why, Mama? She said, because you're married. She said, so our conversation is going to be a little different. <laughs> so, and she said, um, she says, when, when you're wanting your husband to listen to you, she says, when it's something serious and you want his undivided attention, she said, timing is everything. And I said, okay, mama. And she said, timing is everything. She said, don't ask him nothing. If he's hungry, don't ask him nothing if he just got home from work. Don't ask him. <laughs> she said, because you're going to get what you deserve. She said, now, if it's something that needs immediate attention, she said, that one, that's one thing. But it, if it's something that you all really need to talk over and take time with it, she says, don't throw it. If he's hungry or if he is tired, don't do it. 
If he can wait, wait. Make sure he's rested. Make sure he's fed. <laughs> and, and, and that's, and I'm going to tell you what, my mama is dead on it. She's dead on it. This, this guy's not a real happy camper if he's hungry and tired. Both of them together, and you're trying to, you're trying to make your point. <laughs> um, good luck with that. <laughs> uh, you know, like the kids used to say on the schoolyard, fight, 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 fight. <laughs> yeah, that's what's about to happen. So, you know, from that standpoint, um, um, that is very true. That was uh, sound uh, wisdom that I received from my mother, and she was telling the truth. And even when we were growing up and we wanted things, me and my sisters, you know, we wanted to ask our daddy, can we go here? Can we go there? Can we go do this? And we would talk to mama first, and she would say, listen, she says, don't ask him when he gets home. And we're like, why, mama? And she said, if you ask him when he comes in that door, you're going to get a no. She said, your timing is not right. And, you know, it's not something that you can just be able to do one day after, you know, it's it takes time to acquire that kind of uh, thought process. And, you know, let me see. Let me see how he's doing. And I know when we were, as we were getting married, when he was working at the hospital, I used to tell Dr. Woodard, I said, I can tell what kind of day you had by the way you close the door. This is being in tune to your spouse, to your mate. I could tell what kind of day he had by the way he closed that door. And even today, I can tell what kind of day he had by the way the door closes. If the door closes real fast, Quick and happy, he's had a good day. If it's that slow and then click, <laughs> he is worn out. If it's that bam, everybody back up. Don't mess with him. <laughs> Just let him go into his office. And so those are the kinds of things that happen over time. It doesn't happen uh, in those early days uh, because we're still learning each other and you got small children and we're tired, we're frustrated, babies have kept us up all night, and it's just a lot of stuff to go on. And I'm going to say that most of our uh, intense moments of fellowship <laughs> happened when the kids were younger and growing up. Most of the intense moments of fellowship, uh, that's, that's when... You know, but now it's, you know, no, it's not a lot of that going on right now. And it may be because he's so busy and I'm so busy. <laughs> I mean, um, so, so, Dr. Woodard. Well, timing, you know what, and I'm going to throw two evolutionary terms in here only because they're sitting on the tip of my tongue. One is gradualism, gradualism. Gradualism is where one thing just slowly evolves and becomes something else. If I can use that term to talk about marriage, if you allow it to gradually evolve rather than a, another kind of tempo that we'll talk about in just a second. <laughs> got a question. Go ahead. Okay, instead of another kind of tempo. Because the other tempo is what is known as punctuated equilibrium or punctualism, where, where something happens and there's a rapid, rapid movement in another direction. Listen, there are times where we need to actually be thinking along these two lines, the tempo of our lives. Some things need to gradually occur over time. You have to allow them just to to take root, it's not going to happen overnight. There's nothing you can do to push it. If you push it, it would be wrong. Yeah. And at other times... get nothing by force. Right. At nothing. other times, it's punctuated equilibrium, where you're going to have to insert some energy in here to cause it to spin off in another direction. You know, if you were into physics, we'd be talking about, you know, electron spin and whatnot. We're not. But if you want to go in another direction, sometimes you have to have those boosters, like you see NASA, 
which send it in another direction, get it in another course. So our lives are punctuated by gradualism and in this punctual equilibrium, these moments of rapid evolution. And, and kids will cause that rapid evolution to occur just because they're kids and they're growing and they're learning. We had a lot of that. We now are in this place. If we were, if we were a rocket, we'd actually be in space, kind of floating. You know, it doesn't look like it's going much, but if I look at that, say, Mars rover that was moving, you know, at a, a 120,000 miles an hour, which is an awesome speed, um, it, it, but it doesn't look like it's moving like that. You know, you get to a place in your, your lives where the two of you are just moving and, and things are happening. Nothing seems to be throwing it off course, doesn't have to. It would be an occasional call. Hey, something happened. Um, you know, one of the children, something happened to them. And now you've got this moment of, of moving in another direction. But for the most part, it's, it's learning how to control the tempo and the tempers of our lives. Um, and I just throw that out there because that I think that's, that's important. Now, all these extra thoughts about time and biology and whatnot, you know, have come because of the work experience, but they've come over time where you've in, in, in inculcated those into your thought process. But I'm, I'm really into understanding how things evolve, why they evolve, even we as human beings, why we evolve like we do. I'll talk about DNA and, and stuff like that because I'm interested in understanding life in all of its forms. And marital life is one of those things and understanding it in its proper form. So um, just throwing a few thoughts from the biological world, bringing them in here. I tell my kids all the time, you can talk about biology in any sphere. It makes sense in any part of life because it is life. And so understanding some terms kind of say, hey, you know, I never thought about that, but I wish that I had. Okay. So, BC has a question? BC, well, no, yeah, she has a question. And then, um, uh, Pastor Dudley, who's on, uh -uh. Uh, she says... Hey, Gail. <laughs> she says, I prefer the Esther method. And many of you all know the story of Esther. Uh, and so, uh, Pastor uh, Gail, you, you're talking about that Esther method as in terms of being a wife. Uh, to your husband, I'm I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, uh, and you can elaborate on that more if you want in the chat here. Listen, I talk about you all the time <laughs> because when you came to Mount Zion, don't let him butter you up. Say what you want to say. Right. When you came to Mount Zion <laughs> and you talked about changing your name because you were talking about uh, Ruth and Orpa. Right, but she, she talking about Esther today. I got you. <laughs> she talking about Esther. She talking about Esther today. You gonna change your name to Esther? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna change your name to Esther Pastorelli? Okay. Um, so BC said, and then uh, Bam agreed okay. with her. BC said, same for husbands. Don't ask her nothing if she's tired, right? Oh, no, that's true. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna just yes, hallelujah. Yeah. Uh, but this is this takes me back. This takes me back to Ephesians. Uh, that fifth chapter where it talks about marriage like Christ in the church. And then, you know, it says right here, husbands, love your wives. I'm not trying to skip over them previous verses, but we're focusing on how the husbands treat the wives and react to the wives. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, in my Greek and study Bible, Words that are underlined in this Bible are the words I look up because they have a different meaning than they do in the English language in their original language. So I went and I looked up love. And this love right here in this verse is not talking about eros love, exotic love, or physical love. It's talking about philia, friendship. Getting to know your wife tells her that you love her. Uh, wonderful book, and I'm sure many of you know about it, The Five Love, love Languages. There, is, there are certain ways that I feel loved. 
In other ways, well, you know, maybe you love me. And so it's it's very it's very important for husbands to be first of all in tune to their wives. In tune to their wives, especially see it's it's not like it used to be, y'all. Where uh, the the wife is at home and then he comes home. No, we both working, okay? And so if we're both working, uh, <laughs> we need to be in tune to each other. And so just like my sister said, you know, just like I need to be cautious in how I approach him, the same with him approaching me. And that, that reminds me of a friend I had uh, when I was working over at the middle school. Uh, she was so sweet. I really enjoyed working with her. And she, we, we of, course, of course, was married, and we talked about our husbands. Um, and she said, she said, my husband, she says, you know, we've got the kids, and she says, and it's a lot of work uh, with one of her children. It's a lot more work than with the other ones. And she said, she said, and then he just rolls up on me and says he wants to have relations with me. And she said, and I just told him. You can't just roll up on me. You got to romance me. You got to find out what's going on with me. You can't just roll up on me. She said, that's not how it works. Well, that's how it works with communicating. Because you are, the man is the stronger vessel. And so when you roll up on something, it's different from when I roll up on you. Now we do have some strong women out there. <laughs> but the Bible says we're the weaker vessel. So even if I do roll up on you, it's not like you rolling up on me. It's not the same because you are the stronger verse vessel. And my mother told me that too. She said, you know, she said, she says, I'm going to tell you, she says, in marriage, she said, there's a lot of bending that takes place. And I said, I understand that, mama. She said, but what you really need to understand is that you're going to be doing more bending than he is. And I said, Mama, that's, that's not right. She said, it may not be right, but she said, it just that's the way God has built men to be that stronger. She said, so you, she said, I'm not saying that you have to not make your point. She said, but you're going to have to do it gently. You, you have to do it. She said, you get more with honey than you do lemon. She said, you're not the head. You're not the head. She said, but if you're wise, you can be the neck. And she said, the neck is what turns the head. Okay, so, but getting back to what my sister said, that love right there in the 21st verse is talking about filial love, friendship love. Finding out what makes her tick. Finding out as the days, the months, and years go by. What she's like when she gets home from work. Finding out what she's going through. Listening and going back to those points. Be quick to listen. And slow to speak. So that means while I'm talking, and, and of course, I got to say this about my honey love right here, who's very A-tight. And when you're talking to him, he's especially if you've got a problem. When you're talking to him about the problem, he is solving it while you're talking. He's solving it while you're talking. And what I want him to hear is all the details. And he's like, I don't need all the details. This is what you need to do. And I'm like, no, I need you to listen to all the details. That tells me that what? You love me. When you listen to the details. Okay, so yeah, BZ, you okay? You good, BZ? Yeah, we, okay. Yes. And yeah. then and then they say, or not feeling well. Or not feeling well. So be slow to anger. And then uh Aging, yeah, Pastor Douglas Aging says, process. When it's serious, I will ask a close confidant to fast with me and pray. Then I seek God for when to have the conversation. That's the Esther method. Yes, yes. There have been those times where I've had to done just pray about it. And then approach him. I don't, and, and Dr. Woody can tell you this, I don't tell him everything right and way. 
Because, you know, I have to get my own thoughts and words together. Because he is really into that. Your words. You know, he's really listening at your words more than anything. So I have to make sure my words are correct when I come to him with something like that. And so when it's serious, yes, what you said, Pastor Dudley, I will ask a close confidant to fast with me and pray. And, you know, you got to make sure it's a close confidant. You can't, you can't pray with everybody, you know, when it comes to your husband. And many times, um, and, and, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm just saying, uh, Pastor Gail, that those confidants uh, need to be someone who is in the same position that you are. Um, a single person is not a confidant for a married person uh, when it comes to the things between he and I. Um, it's going to be someone who's married. And it's not going to be necessarily someone who's been married for a little while. It's going to be somebody who's been married for a long while. <laughs> Amen. Those are the best ones. The ones, somebody's been married 30, 40, 50, 60 years, talk to them. Um, and so, like she said, when it's serious, I will ask a close confidant to fast with me and pray. Amen. To fast with me and pray. And that, and that, th those two things have to be front and center too, just like Pastor Gail is saying. Fast and pray. Not have a discussion. Sometimes we do too much talking with confidence when what we really need with confidence is to fast and to pray. Amen. And just knowing, just knowing, Pastor Gail, um, and, and, and others, timing, I'm sure, is in her mind. Because, remember, Esther said, we're going to pray and fast, and, but it was a specific time. Okay, we're going to have these couple days, and then I'm going to go. I'm going to look for that opportune time. And I think one of the, the inactivities that happens in our lives is we leave it indefinite saying, I'm going to wait till the Spirit moves. Now, I'll put a time limit on I think it's very good. Yes. Because... I will, if I have a very important decision, there will be a time limit to the decision-making process, okay? Because at some point, you've got to be active and you've got to step into the ring. Otherwise, you leave that hanging out there and paralyze your other movements. So I think it's important. And you can use that philosophy with just about anything. Hey, listen, I'm going to look for a new job. I'm going to put a definite time on that. I'm going to look for... You know, a house, put a definite time on that period. Because if, in fact, we leave it to the abstract, how long is that going to be? Uh, some things never get done. And so I would definitely put a time limit on it. Yes, and, and um, just as you're talking about that, I'm reading um, uh, what Pastor Gail Dudley has expounded on uh, the Esther method. And she says, after reading Esther, this is what God has showed me for a specific situation. I've kept this from for, from several years ago. Uh, she asked for nothing. Right. She asked for nothing. Um, and um, uh, she said she, the first thing she did was fast. Third day, prepare, speak with boldness and confidence. You will receive greatness. You will have the estate, a new loan, celebrate whatever I request of Kevin. That's her husband, mm -hmm. Pastor Kevin Dudley. I will receive as long as it aligns up with God's word. And there you have it. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great outline. It, you know, we have a lot of things we've desired as women. And I tease, and he'll tell you, I tease him all the time. You know, when I'm just wanting to have a little time with him. And I know he's busy. But, you know, sometimes I will encourage him to just, you know, pull away a little time for me. And then he can get back to what he's doing. Uh, and then I'll throw out there, and I said, you know what? I don't ask you for a lot of stuff. And he'll tell you. I don't ask Dr. Woodard for a lot of material things. The most I ask him for, and he'll, he's here to attest to it. What do I ask you for most? Besides looking into my eyes. 
Well, that's time with you it to look time. into your it eyes. Is it is time. But, you know, it's certainly quality time is something that I appreciate. It's, a, it's part of the love language for me. So quality time is good. Um, and I, it lines up with God's word. Right. Now, timing. And this is the piece. I think sometimes we want to force fit our time into somebody else's time slot. And we've got to be careful because I can get agitated by a mound of work that's on the other side, knowing that I have all that work. And you're saying, hey, listen, we need time. It's let me get this piece. And I think everybody understands it. Let me get this taken care of a piece of piece of the way. Because what I don't want to face is a relaxed period of time that gets extended, and then I've still got a mound of work on the other side. I think from anybody's standpoint in the workplace, you know, it's always when is that opportune moment when I can just throw things away, throw them aside, push, um, and get, have an opportunity to just... Keep talking. Uh, okay. This one, who's this, man? Yeah. Yeah, it's getting ready to die. Okay. Um, to get something. I, I want you to know that this past week I had, um, boy, I was thinking I was having a second bout with with COVID, um, COVID nineteen. I chose some of them to pray for it you. Just, because you man, that headache that I had uh, one year ago, it was March sixteenth that I came down with COVID in twenty twenty. Had it for eighteen days. Man, that same sort of headache appeared. I couldn't shake it. I couldn't take enough to to relieve it. Um, you know, you, whether it, it, I'm trying to, because I, I have a shot coming up on March 19th, I'm trying, there it is, I'm trying to stay away from uh, the NSAIDs, so I was taking Tylenol, 1,000 of Tylenol, like Q4, Q6, um, just for this headache, and I'm like, man, I can't keep doing this, so I took a day off, but what a great day off it was, um, Thursday, because I got, once I started feeling a little better, felt a crack in the armor, I tried to get up, get moving, do some things. And I, I was slowly doing work. And because of not having the pressure of time or students or people just in your ear, um, it, it kind of dissipated. Still went to work Friday, still had a headache. But by the time half the day was over, it really had started changing. But I thought it, it, it broke Thursday night for me after having come on me Wednesday afternoon. So, you know, you just kind of watch and, and stress is real and, and timing is real. Uh, prayer is real. And so grateful to God of just making sure that, you know, you, you, you're, you're able to accomplish some stuff. But I'm sitting here this morning much more relaxed than, than I would have been had I gone to work on Thursday um, and, and really just shot home Wednesday because I wasn't feeling well instead of extending it to the night. Um, was able to get Bible study together and, and just, you know, there it is. Your, your schedule slows down enough. You got some stuff. It's the end of the quarter. All these kids, all these parents. Listen, craziness is um, in this virtual world, these kids will wait till the last minute and start stuffing the ballot box with all their things you know, they got nine weeks worth of stuff they're trying to do in three days, and they're thinking that they ought to score enough points. And it's like, on no given project are you going to get very many points. You're going to get some points, but some's better than nothing. That's what I tell them. But there's no way you can you could ever do enough, you know, in 48 hours to uh, the quality of work. And that's why we space it out. But, you know, knowing all that quarter's coming to an end, it feels real good to be sitting here just talking and saying, all right. Um, okay, so we got some more. Um, okay, yeah, get the questions. Come on, bring the questions. Okay, so, um, and so Pastor Gail Deli said this was a college situation that she had been praying about uh, when she was talking about the Esther approach. Um, uh, and uh, Bam said, I'm so with you on that. And if I am quiet, watch out. I'm going to tell you what, still water runs deep. And, and, and I've said that many a times. You, you're saying a lot if you're not saying anything. But here's the thing about that. That can only go on for a little while because there has to be communication. You can't remain silent. If you're, if you're silent, 
Just like Pastor Gail Dudley says, you need to be fasting and praying so that when you do open your mouth, amen, it will be with wisdom, pure wisdom that comes from above. It won't be selfish ambition or anything like that. It will be wisdom. It will be you fighting to keep your marriage rather than fighting to be right. Amen. And that's why we have to fight fair. Christians fight fair because we fight to stay together more than we fight to be right. Amen. And so that's what Bam said. And uh, Pastor Dudley said, I agree with you. Uh, First Lady Woodard, she said, my confidant was an older married woman, married for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I uh, um, had um, Bam say, she usually talks, ask her mom for advice. And certainly we know Mother Hemphill, who has been married. Her, she's a widow, but She's been married. She's still been married for a lot of years. And it takes a special kind of mom, a special kind of mom for you to be able to talk to her about your marriage. Amen. And then there are some things that, you know, you may want to keep to yourself and you don't want to tell your mom. Because I'm going to tell you what Ben Jean <laughs> told me. These are our talks after I got married. And she says, listen. She says, she says, you need to know that I love Mel. She said, and I want y'all's marriage to work. She says, and I feel like it's going to work anyway. She said, but she says, when you get mad with him, she says, you know, if, if it's not something real, real serious, she said, if you get mad with him, she said, don't come tell me that you're mad with him. Don't come tell me what, you, what he did. And I said, mama, I can't come tell you. She said, no, because you're my daughter. She says, and she said, depending on what it is, I'll, I'll still have an attitude with him when y'all come to my house. <laughs> she said, I'll still have attitude. And y'all been made love and made up, and I'm still mad. She said, so if you can keep it to yourself, keep it to yourself. She said, but you know, if you want to share with me about advice, about what you should do and that kind of thing. She said, but if he done really made you mad or really done something, she said, you, you need to talk to the Lord. She said, because I will have the tendency to take your side. But I really don't see that in my mother. I mean, and that's why I say, bam, it takes a special kind of mom to continue to love your husband or your wife, whoever, whichever, even when you tell them the negative things, to continue to love them unconditionally. And it takes a special kind of woman. Uh, a special kind of confidant who can love both of you. And, and then that's the way it should be. Because, you know, I don't care what side of the story they give you. There's always another side to the story. And, 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 and Proverbs says it's foolish to try to answer something without all the parties present. So you need to do what Pastor Gail Dudley said. Find you a confidant and have them fast and pray with you. Not have a major discussion over it. Amen? Mm. Not have a major discussion over it. So, okay, and uh, let's see. And then BC says, think about doing a workshop on love languages. That would be great. Oh. Uh, BC, you're going to give me too many jobs, girl. I... Right. Uh, what I meant to say, you and Mel facilitate the workshop. Girl, y'all, that's my baby sister. Pastor Dudley, that's my baby sister. Ignore her. <laughs> Everybody ignore Beasy. Um, we gonna have to break it down to once a month. <laughs> Cause that's, I'm trying to make sure I've got questions, the ones I can see. Oh, Bam has a question here off the off the radar right here. Mm -hmm. She said, if you're getting the vaccine, do you we stop taking a leave Tylenol aspirin two weeks before we get the shot? Yes. Yes. Stop. You should, because anything that suppresses the system may very well suppress the response that is supposed to go on uh, once you get the shot. So as much as possible, stay away from that stuff for two weeks prior. Once you get done, um, Tylenol is probably a good thing to to take immediately afterwards. Okay, I'm going to put my hand on the YouTube screen here because I want to make sure that I'm getting questions. Okay, yes, thank God. I like my husband because when, 
Uh oh, it went away. Because um, when the love is not there, I still like him. <laughs> when the love, you know what that? You know what that? Uh, who was that? That's Kim Gregory. You know what, Kim? I gotta say this, huh? Where's your glasses? Right here. But that's that's not why I can't see it. It's not because of my glasses. Uh, I gotta say this, Kim. Uh, when Dr. Wood and I went to this uh, marriage workshop, uh, they had this uh, country western singer sing the song, and we loved the song so much we bought two of his CDs. But it said, even when it doesn't feel like it, it's still love. <laughs> even when I don't act like it, it's still love. Yeah, even when it doesn't look like it, it's still love. And why is that? Because if we are uh, intimate allies attacking the, attacking the chaos of a fallen world together with God in the middle, and we made God a promise before people, or before the judge, or whoever we made it before, we made God a promise. Amen. And we're never giving up, even if it don't feel like love. Amen. Because feelings come and feelings go. And that's something that one of my sons asked me, who is now married to a beautiful young lady, Chrissy Renee Harris Woodard. Um, he asked me long before he even asked Chrissy to marry him. He said, Mama, how did you and Daddy know that you guys were the one for each other? And he said, how did you... He said, how do you know? And I said, let me tell you something about love, baby. Love is a choice. So you need to choose wisely. And, you know, when you look into the word of God, you need to choose wisely. If it doesn't add up, if, it's, if you can't make your choice based on the very word of God, then it's, it doesn't add up. And I said, but love is a choice. It's not a feeling. It's not, oh, she makes me feel this way or he makes me feel this way no 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 because i'm gonna tell you what feelings come and feelings go i said one day i'm feeling like i love you daddy and one day i'm like i'm about tired of you now okay and, and so then so feelings come and feelings go but i made a choice that i was gonna love this guy until one of us goes to glory i mean i made a choice i said so love is a choice it's not based on feelings amen just like you decided to make Jesus your choice when you got married, you decided to make your two your choice because your first choice was God. Amen. And he's the one that's going to help you to love until death that second choice that you made. So I, I think love is a choice, honey. It ain't no feeling. And, and don't believe in people that's telling you it's 50-50. I was looking at this clip of someone on uh, Instagram. They were doing a reel. Um, and it was a clip uh, from um, Claire Huxtable on their show where she tells Elvin that marriage is 50-50. And you know what? That, that couldn't be farther from the truth. But, I mean, it, it was a show. Uh, the Cosbys. And I said to myself, wow, that, that, that happened a long time ago, but it's so not true. And, and I got to tell you why I say that. Because we were at a wedding... He went back to Lorraine to do a wedding. We were at a wedding. And they did the most wonderful thing. Is they had couples stand up at the reception to give, uh, if you will, words of advice to this newly married couple. And she said, if you've been married, she's asked how many years. You've been married 25 years, stand up. And had them give advice. If you, and she said, and, and she just kept going. And then we got to a couple that had been married, what, 60-something years? Mm -hmm. I, about 70 years. Her husband wasn't with her. So she stood up. She said, I'm by myself. She said, but I've been married 70 years. And she says, me and my husband have never been apart. She said, but he is now in a nursing home. And she said, and the only reason I'm not there now is because I wanted to come here. She said, but she said, so what would your advice be to this couple being married 70 years? And she says, don't believe that marriage is 50 50. <laughs> and then that's what she said. Don't believe that. She said, that's not even biblical. She said, because there are going to be times in your marriage where it's going to be 60 40. 
It may be uh, 2080. And one of you is having to carry the load more than the other one. She said, but she said, know full well that God can hold your marriage together. She said, but don't, don't go forward thinking that it's 50-50. She says, because you're going to be disappointed. And it's just not real. 50-50 is not a real, no. No, when, when you make those vows, what does it say? What, what does the book say? From this day forward, in sickness and in hell, rich or poor. <laughs> now, without, yeah. without, without the rituals, and I want you guys to hear me. I, I hear words, but I also understand the concepts behind the words, and I think it's, that's even more important than the words. Because somebody could say, for richer, for poor, for better, for worse, Okay, and you're saying, you know, I can look at my situation and part it out. No, there are trade-offs. Life is full of trade-offs. Marriage is full of trade-offs. And, and the energy, where does the energy come from? Well, the energy very well may come from both. There would be 50-50. It may come from one more than the other, 70-30, 80-20. It just depends on what season of life we are in. There was a wonderful thing on NBC or CBS News the other night about a, uh, um, uh, two 90-year-olds, noctogenarians, okay? I think they're both 91, or 91, 92. And they found each other during COVID and didn't want to be apart during COVID. And uh, I guess he asked her to marry him uh, more than a dozen times, and she finally said yes. <laughs> And it was the cutest thing watching this couple. And uh, he said, you haven't, you haven't held my hand all day. She's driving the car. She said, hold it now. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, she, I'm going to come back to some cute time. When they, got, when they got done and they parked, she said, give me a kiss. He gave her a kiss. He said, that'll do you all week. She said, he lying. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is, is that they're the energy trade-offs and what happens. And I do realize I, I am so into the biologics of life, understanding that things have to evolve and they typically evolve very slowly, very continuously. They have, uh, it's punctuated by moments of, of, of rapid evolvement into a different equilibrium. You move. Your, your children have to go away to school. Things happen. Yeah. Okay? And then you have to see yourself in a different uh, way of life. But you have done your first and foremost duty in the repopulation and, and passing on your genes if you have children. And you work to keep that line alive. Um, because that's, that's nature. That's, and then we say human nature. Well, we think about the brain and the gut and the immune system and all that good stuff. So it, it trade-offs, trade-offs. And, and, and here's what I always bring to the Bible. And I think that that's one of the things that keeps our preaching um, feeling, at least to me, fresh, on target, whatnot. It's not preaching old thoughts. It's preaching thoughts about life from different vantage points. And, and, and utilizing what wisdom and knowledge we've, we've gained and understanding about life and in looking at it from, through a different lens, from a different perspective and saying, yeah, you know, I, I never thought about it from that perspective before. Well, I wasn't there before. I didn't have to have that energy trade-off. Think about um, the woman that Bev was just speaking about who was without her husband after 70 years. He's in the nursing home. Well, the energy trade-off's different. How do, I, how do I fill in that time but maintain the love? What do I need to do to remind him that he's loved? And then from his perspective, how do I remind her in my debilitated state that I love her? What can I do in these moments to keep things going? I think we're all going to be challenged by life at some point or another to realize about the trade-offs and what we have to do. But you want a partner who understands. Yes. You certainly don't want... And, and a partner who understands and seeks 
to understand you and you seek to understand each other. Right. Yes. You don't want to be like that comedian who uh, was talking and, and it was a female comedian at that <laughs> where she was talking about a 50 year old man was married to a 20 year old girl and she didn't realize um, that he was stroking and he, he eventually succumbed to the stroke. She said, I thought you were making faces and you didn't know. He said, you need somebody who can go along with you. Who, who will carry got your medicine. Got your medicine <laughs> and understands that when you need some help, you'll find it. Oh, my so, goodness. Yeah. Questions? Well, when, he, when he was talking about the elderly couple in the car together, I can remember conversations between my mother and father. Uh, and uh, And this was... I mean, decades ago. I think we were in the car driving to Dayton, uh, Texas, where my mom's parents lived. And her and daddy were talking. And uh, she said, you know what? She said, you used to, she said, we used to sit close together in the car. And he said, well, he said, I'm still driving. He said, I ain't never moved. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought that was hilarious. He said, I'm, I'm still driving. I didn't move my seat. So, and then another time he said something to Mama. Uh, and, of course, she was jesting with him. You know, they, they were fussing with each other a little bit. And she said, you, she said, you go sleep on the couch. She said, you go sleep on the couch. And Daddy said, he said, if you don't want to be next to me, you don't have to be next to me. He said, but I'm not getting up out of my bed. <laughs> he said, I bought this bed. He said, if you don't want to be next to me, you go sleep on the couch. He said, but I'm fine with you right there. <laughs> but this, when he said that, I just thought about those two things that uh, were like running jokes between my mother and father who were married 64 years. 64 years. What a legacy. What a testimony before your children. Amen. And I was just talking to my oldest son last night on the phone. He's going through some things and some of you have reached out to him. So just keep praying for Melvin. But he's got his head on. And so I'm, that right there says a lot and brings me great comfort just from talking with him. I talked with him over an hour and he was talking about marriage and he's the only one who really doesn't have a significant other. <laughs> But uh, he was talking about um, his grandparents, my mother and father, his parents, who were married 54 years, 56. Um, he he got to do the man. Right. <laughs> I mean, it, was, it was right at 55. Cause it, okay. Because they got married in 57, December 24th, 57. Dad died in 2012 in July. It okay. Was, so it was, they it was were in close. their 55th year. They were in their 55th year. And then he says, he says, Mom, I can't tell you how, he says, a lot of my friends, when I talk to them, you know, they ask about you guys. And he says, oh, you, your parents, they, they, are they together? I'm like, oh, yeah, they've been married 30 years. And, you know, he says, me and my friends tell me, man, that is unheard of. But we've come from a long line of love. A long line of love. Amen. We've, we've come from a long line of shining examples of what it means to from do from this day forward. Amen. So um, the recipe, the main ingredient of the recipe is God. Amen. If, if you want to make it work, God has to be in the middle because he ordained marriage. All these other different kind of marriages you see, uh, arranged marriages, prenups, let's try it out before we really do it. No, and all these other marriages that we see now is not what God ordained. And so if you don't want to be a part of that statistics that says that 50% of all marriages, no matter what color you are, no matter what age you are, no matter how much money you have, will fail. And it's up to us as children of God, for those of us who know the Lord and the pardon of our sins, to make the difference. By putting God in the middle of that marriage and not giving up. Okay? And so, uh, number one, quick to listen. Number two, slow to speak. And three, slow to anger. But I'm going to tell you what. Slow to anger is, is, is go it's not going to be a problem if you quick to listen <laughs> and slow to speak. 
then the anger may not even show up. But the anger typically shows up when ain't nobody listening and everybody want to talk, want to be heard. That's when folk get angry. You're not listening to me. No, you're not listening to me. Listen to what I'm saying. No, listen to what I'm saying. So he got two things here I want to tell you, and then we're going to probably close it down. Um, if you can sense that a fight is imminent, <laughs> is imminent. And some of us can sense that. Like if 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 the wife come in and clear the counter or the husband come in and that door slams. I mean it slams so hard that the stuff is coming off of the table. You know, you you know when the fight is imminent. You know. And I'm sure Ron Woody could tell you when he knew when the fight was imminent with me. My children knew. My children knew because first of all, there wouldn't be no food on the, the stove by dinner time. And I will have slammed the double doors of that bedroom and still up there when he got home. And uh, Jasmine, she's on here. She used to tease us all the time. She said, I wish you all would have y'all little fights uh, after dinner. She said, because when it's before dinner, all of us sitting here trying to figure out what we're going to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so it says, when you can sense that a fight is intimate, intimate, imminent, before you say anything, before you open that mouth, because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Amen, Elder Ruth Pugh. She says that every morning after prayer. Speak life. If you know you're not finna speak life, don't, don't you open your mouth. Don't do it. And it says, don't say anything. Get control and zip your lip. Then ask yourself these two questions. These two questions. Should what I'm thinking be said? <laughs> Should what I'm thinking be said? Should I say this? I think we would have had experience like that. Should I say it? I'm going to leave it. <laughs> should I say it? Like, no. If you got to ask if you should say it, no, you shouldn't say it. And then the second question is, should what I'm thinking be said right now? Going back to timing is everything. Timing is everything. If you feel a little fight coming on, is what I'm going to say right now. Do I need to say it? Is it going to bring life, healness, and wholeness, or is it going to tear down? Is it going to build up, or is it going to tear down? Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. So that's why you have to check your tongue. Hold your tongue. You know, we got a song we sing in church. Hold my tongue, Lord, while I run this race. Amen. And the same goes in marriage. And so, should what I'm thinking be said right now? And that 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 also needs to go on social media. Should what I'm thinking be put in the feed now? Should, it, should I do it? Or, you know, should I do it now? Or should I wait? You know, we had that experience uh, on a, a grander scale. But, so those two questions, if you... If you feel like a fight is imminent, timing is everything, and your words are everything. And one thing about words is you can't take them back. It's like in a court of law. They may scratch it from the record, but it's already been in the hearing of all the people present, particularly the jury. So they heard it, even though it had been scratched on the record, they still heard it. Amen. So that's why you have to think before you speak and season everything you say with salt. Amen. Be salt and light in your marriage too. Amen. <laughs> and what does salt do? Salt makes something that tastes bad, taste better. Something that's unsavory, if you add salt to it, just a pinch of salt, all of a sudden it tastes better. Or the flavors are enhanced with a pinch of salt. And you know what light does? Light dispels the darkness. So being salt and light is a lot of, um, has a lot to do with before you open the mouth. Is this going to be salt and light or is this going to cause a bigger fire? <laughs> okay? So. Yeah, well, let me, let me just challenge you all. You know, most times when I ask young scholars 
a question and they try to answer it. They try to answer it with the understanding they have. And you go, well, that would be right. To some extent, but I'm an educator. And what I say is, when you're trying to answer something or you're trying to think through it, go read a couple pages on it before you, <laughs> before you try to explain your own thoughts. Because most times, the thoughts that any one of us have could be enhanced by a few pages of reading. Mm. So instead of, it, should I say what I'm thinking That's right now? That's like fasting and praying. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, but it, it goes to that point, I think, mm -hmm. even more. Mm -hmm. Should I say what I'm thinking? No, not if you're not armed. Not if you're properly armed with the right information. If you haven't thought through the process. And should I say it right now? Not until I've read something. One of the... One of the pieces that I shared just last week, pastorally, was the, the miracle morning. And the miracle morning, there's six different steps involved. But one of the steps is read a few pages. What does that do? It enhances your cognitive abilities, your understanding. It lends itself to being, uh, you know, inculcated or incorporated into your thought processes which is what got me to bring in that devotional piece, even back here. Read a few things in the morning, a few pages of stuff. Actually, I read two scientific peer-reviewed journal articles this morning, along with my devotional and my Bible. And what? Pastor, I can't do this that is, every day. This is what I'm faced with every day, y'all. Right. This I can't, is what I'm faced I, with. I can't I do it. You, you say, I can't do that. Well, what it does is it arms me for the rest of the day to be able to talk to anybody about what I have read that day. Okay? So then my conversation is seasoned with salt and with light because it's not just thoughts. Because I don't mind sharing thoughts that don't make sense to me yet. Saying, you know, I read this thought. And I think it's worth thinking about. And I also think, all right, we'll get to it. And it's what makes education so powerfully wonderful for me because I share stuff. Um, let me give you a question. And I'm going because I got to go back to it. <laughs> you know, how will humans evolve in the future? And you go, well, that's not a question I need to ask. Okay, well, let me, put, let me make it so that it's palatable to you. What are you going to look like 10 years from now? What's going to happen to your family, <laughs> your children, when they are grown adults? And if you have young grandchildren, we've got four of them. What are you doing to ensure that when they are your age, they are well-rounded? Okay, there's the bring it home. Bring the stuff home. And I think the more we can, can utilize our heads, put it, you know, around that word of God, we will be far better off. So, hey, listen, my contract time is up. <laughs> okay. So Mother Triggs, who was married almost 50 years, right? She's on, and I like what Sister Triggs said. She said, Sister Woodard, I agree with you because my mother and Reverend Triggs' mother would say the same thing as your mother said. And I'm sure she's talking about, don't tell me what he done did wrong because I have an attitude. <laughs> and when he come over here, I'll be looking at him sideways. Uh, so uh, I think that's what she's talking about. And that's why I say it takes a special kind of mom to be able to counsel their son um, or daughter and same for father to counsel his son or uh, counsel his son and mother counsel her daughter as to um, marital advice um, and just like we just said it has to be seasoned with salt and light and not necessarily what you feel and what you think you tell your children what thus say the Lord Amen. And and my children know. I tell them what thus say the Lord. I'm not going to make a decision for you. I will tell you what the Bible says. And I will tell you what God expects. 
but I'm not going to make a decision for you because when I'm dead and gone, you're not going to be telling somebody that I told you to do this and I told you to do that. No, I told you what the Bible says. I told you what the Lord desires. And that's who you're living for. That's, that's, that's what you're working. That's what you're working towards. One day when you see him face to face and you tell him, hey, I did it. Just like you said for me, I tried to do it the way you wanted me to do it. And I hung in there. Amen. Or I've stayed in there. In the words of Mother Chilton, she said, Christian folks don't need to be hanging in nothing. She said, we need to get in there and stay in there. That's Mother Chilton, one of our church mothers. God rest. I miss her so much. I mean, she's still living. We just don't see our senior saints because of COVID. Right. Mother Children's absolutely right. I'm going to bring in Mother Dalton, and with this, we're going to say goodbye. <laughs> Mother Dalton, is she, she, would, she was not a Christian when I first met her husband. Right. She, it, she had here's, been, a, here's a hope story. Yeah, this, I saw something in him, and he wanted to become a deacon in my first church. And uh, I said to him, I said, why don't you ask your wife if she'll make me dinner? <laughs> and I, I said, I'm just coming over for dinner. And I left the hospital one night, went to dinner, had a wonderful dinner. She, she put was together. Some more cook. She was. Mm. So we sat there. I never, ever, and I'll be honest, I never said a word about the Bible, never said a word about him being a deacon, never said a word about I wanted her to come to church. I just said, I was coming to dinner. When I got done with dinner that night, I said, can I ask you one thing? And I, I could see her brace herself because she thought I probably was going down that road. I said, if I ask you, would you invite me back again? What would you say? She said, you want to come back to my table? <laughs> I said, yes. And she kind of bounced back like that. She said, absolutely, I'll cook again. I said, good. I said, I'll tell, I'll tell him when it, when's a good opportunity and I'll be back. I didn't have to. She came to church the next Sunday. Once she came to church that first Sunday, she never missed another Sunday unless she she was sick, had something. And I, I don't remember many Sundays that she was she not was there. there. She was there. Became a deaconess. He became chairman of deacons. It was a wonderful thing. But I never talked to him about. And see, the thing of it was, I just thought if you'd make me dinner and I could sit down and appreciate you, maybe somehow or another, you could appreciate the God I serve. And absolutely work. But she used to have to say this thing to John as she got mad at him. She looked at him, she go, ha, ha, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. All right, so ha, ha, here, here we, we go. go. <laughs> we'll see you back in another month, okay? Yes. And you know, if she wants to come on, I just know that there, there's a there's a lot that happens over the weekend to get ready. I pray that it's been helpful. Yes. Um certainly don't want to be too preachy, but certainly know that we need to give you what's on our hearts and certainly share. Got some questions? Certainly shoot them at us. We'll be prepared to talk to you that first weekend in April. And you know it's going to go by really fast. Okay? Uh, Pastor Gail says she want to know when the conference is and the books and the study guides. <laughs> Girl, I'm, I'm, I'm writing book number but, two. I'm behind you. You know, I've been doing all this educating. It's now time for me to write. I, I got to get this other stuff. But yeah, okay. Listen, Good. between you and BZ, Pastor Dudley, y'all go get us killed. <laughs> Girl, okay. I got so much on my plate. It's crazy. Yes, me too. All right. Hey, let's pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we certainly thank you for this, another opportunity to come by airways to friends, family, friends, and to those even that are becoming new friends. We pray, Father God, that you'll allow your word to go forth. We know that it will never come back void. We thank you for just our experiences, which is what we talk from, what we've come to understand in three decades worth of time. Amen. And Lord, you have blessed us tremendously, and we can look at those blessings and say thank you for all the superintending, all the work that has been done. Just like that, we've seen three church families. We've seen um, how you have kept us. So, Father God, we pray that you would lead us and guide us as only you can. And even thank you for the 
the the momentary <laughs> interruption. Okay, because that's life. Momentary interruptions. God bless each and every one of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Love you. We love all hey, of y'all. Hey, you know what that call came right on time. Got it. <laughs> Talk to you. Okay. You got that one? Yeah. I'm going to try my best to go back and look at all this stuff. But love you guys here on YouTube, Kim, Carmen, Nia, and Kim Gregory, Teresa. Um, who else is on here? I'm sorry, y'all. My eyes are, my husband's right. I need my glasses. Tristan, love all of y'all. Bye-bye.